We interrupt your broadcast to bring you an episode from the Stephen or Else Network of Truly Epic Podcast. Find more shows at StephenOrElse.com. Bullets won't hurt them. Flames won't kill them. They're the weirdest menace the Earth has ever seen. Mere humans don't stand a chance against the riled up, renegade robot forces of the mysterious mega intelligent Factor Max. Does the world's snappiest superhero have a hope on which to hang his hat? Strap yourself in for another hyperactive hayride. That's today on Just Another Fanboy. Hello and welcome to another episode of Just Another Fanboy, the podcast that's now living in a house with four cats. I'm your host, my name is Steven, and yeah, four cats. There was a time when I swore I would never, never, ever, 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 never, ever, 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 ever live with another cat again, and now I'm living with four. But, you know, I'm actually rather fond of the four of them, and so what are you going to do, right? Anyway, that's not why we're here. We're here to further explore the adventures of of Frank Einstein, the madman of Snap City. So how about we just go ahead and do that? Today, we're looking at Madman Comics, issue number 10. This issue was published by Dark Horse on February 1st, 1996. It had a cover price of $2.95, and it is entitled Runaway Renegade Robots or Factor Max Rising. The writer and artist was, of course, Mike Allred, letters by Sean Connaught, and the colorist was Laura Allred. And like last week, the opening of the episode there is the, uh, the official blurb description, you know, the thing that tells you what you might encounter if you read this book. Well, that came from DarkHorse.com. All right, we're going to start with the cover. This cover to issue number 10 of Madman Comics from Dark Horse, published February 1st, 1996, has something unique about it. This cover's artwork is Alex Ross painting over Mike Allred's pencils. That's, uh, that's pretty cool. And we're in some kind of weird laboratory with a weird screen that has like that Looney Tunes background on it when Porky Pig comes out and goes, that's all, folks. And uh, I know it's not supposed to be that, but that's what I think of or or the beginning of the Looney Tunes or the Merry Melodies or whatever. When the, the Warner Brothers logo comes out and he goes, that's what it makes me think of. We see it later in the issue, but that's what it makes me think of. But 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 we are in some kind of laboratory on this cover. There is a robot with lightning bolts, electricity lancing out of them. That electricity is shocking Mott and Machina. You know what? I got to ask this question. Anybody who knows, especially Mr. Allred, if, if, you're, if you're listening to this one, is it Machina or Machina? The only reason I ask is because I believe the issue that she first appeared in, because she's a robot, was called X Machina. Or is her name Machina and the title of that issue was X Machina? I don't know. And I'm an inquiring mind, so I need to know. You've also got Frank and Joe on the cover. Dr. Flem, he's tied up. And Bonnie is there. And there's a hand in the foreground. (laughs) I don't know whose hand that is, but uh, that's kind of funny. That, yeah, I don't know whose hand that is. It can't be Gail's. She's the only one that's not, well, that doesn't appear on the cover. that's, That's in the issue, as far as I can remember. Anyway, doesn't really matter. Let's get into this story, okay? If you remember from last time, Frank had been through, well, a harrowing few days. Going back a few issues, he had gone to visit Professor Boyford in the hospital, couldn't see him because the hospital's security wouldn't let anybody in. He and Joe left. They found a a moving van on the side of the road. There was a guy in the back of it. He was being attacked by little alien guys with moons for heads, and they set the man on fire. The moon men ran away. Frank and Joe took the victim to the hospital and then found 
the big guy who is apparently a, a famous adventurer. He was uh he was taking Professor Boyford away, and so Frank had to get mixed up in that. There's actually a little bit of time travel involved with that story, just a slight bit. And so he goes on this adventure with the big guy, Frank Miller's the big guy, and it's a it's a two issue adventure in which robots are trying to kidnap Professor Boyford. Robots sent by another robot named Factor Max. Well, they don't get Professor Boyford. The robots are defeated. Frank's back in the hospital because during this adventure with the big guy, a agent of Tri-Eye by the name of Skip, he tried to help the two of them keep these robots off of Professor Boyford. And he was shot over and over and over again. He kept getting up and he kept getting shot, but he was in the hospital and Frank was kind of looking over him to make, you know, staying with him until he knew that the guy was uh, going to pull through. And uh, that's when he encounters the fella that he had rescued a few issues back who was being attacked by the moon men. The, when he caught on fire, it was some kind of weird alien chemical and it was messing with his skin. And now he's a puke monster. He's made out of human vomit. And Frank had to then defend the hospital from the puke monster, had to put a little plan into motion to stop the puke monster from eating everybody because it was absorbing doctors, kind of like the blob would do. But this time it's puke, which is pretty gross. Using some chemicals, he manages to shrink the puke monster into, uh, well, about the size of something you could fit in a gallon jug of milk. And then Frank ends up shrinking as well. And so he has an adventure as a little tiny action figure sized man. He meets a robot by the name of Myron, who sounds like Mr. Wolf from Pulp Fiction. And that actor's name, for some reason, is just escaping me. Harvey Keitel. Boom! Steven pulls it out in the end. So there's a little adventure there. Frank meets the third of the Nephites, who dunks. Frank into a well water, a well of water, which washes all the chemicals off of him and he grows back into large size. And he and Myron go back to Dr. Flem's place because the reason Myron was there in the first place trying to find Frank is that a bunch of robots had stormed into Dr. Flem's lab and just kidnapped everybody and destroyed a bunch of the robots, including Myron's mutter. He was not that happy about it. So Frank arms himself. He grabs some kind of flamethrowing rifle and four different pistols and straps them around himself in various places. And he's getting ready to head out with Myron when Astro Man enters the picture. Astro Man uh, was dead. Well, as dead as a robot can be, but Dr. Flem obviously built him. So that's where we're at when we start this issue, issue number 10. Astro Man, Myron, and Frank have set off into the rocket car tunnels because that's where the, the robots took Gale and Bonnie and Dr. Flem and Joe. And so as this issue opens, they're, they're in the rocket car tunnels. And what I'm going to do here, this is not something I, I normally do, but I feel like you need to understand exactly what, is, what, what Frank is feeling right now. So I'm going to read you from his journal, the narration boxes, just, just a couple of pages, not, not all the pages here in the beginning, but I think a lot of these really speak to uh, kind of, kind of, well, they kind of help set the mood. We know what Frank is feeling and what may happen when he encounters all them robots. So again, I'm going to say this every single episode, the narration boxes are, well, they're supposed to represent Frank's journal writing. And it's not formatted like you're reading a journal, but based on previous issues where he's writing in the journal as we're reading the narration boxes, I'm assuming that every time we see a narration box, it's him writing in his journal. We're just reading stuff from the future. We're reading or, or reading stuff that's talking about stuff that happened in the past. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Here we go. <clears throat> I'm pulsing, robbing with hateful adrenaline. I want to kill. Have I ever felt this way before? I can't recall. Still, it's a very familiar feeling. 
I'm ashamed to admit it, but I like it. I feel powerful. It's the freedom of having nothing to lose. Could Astro Man be a part of this? These multiplying robots started with him, right? I'm going to kill this Factor Max. I'd kill anyone who touched a hair on Joe's head. She's all that matters to me. If Factor Max were more than a manufactured robot, could I feel so strongly about destroying it? If it were a life form, for instance. It's become clear that these robots led by Factor Max have replicated themselves out of some desire to exist. Does this make them living creatures? If they were, could I really destroy their lives? Would this prevent me from wrapping my hands around their necks, twisting, turning, pulling, and thrusting until I wrench their heads from their bodies? I just want Joe back. Safe. I'm starting to get misty. I've got to concentrate. I'll stay alert, alive with hatred. What's happening to me? I'm pulsing with power at the thought of taking life. Is my conscience gone? Did I ever have one? Is this new invigoration actually an echo of the real me lost since my resurrection? Is my innocence lost to this new emotion? This new exciting desire to crush and destroy? I can't lie to myself. I'm drooling at the thought of squeezing out the life and letting it drip from my quivering fingers. Even if it is just the memory from an out of control, walking, talking computer head. I don't care what happens after. I don't care what anyone thinks or does. I want satisfaction. I want death and more death. I want to kill until there's no one left to be sorry. Phew. Get a grip, Frank. Where is this coming from? For all you know, Joe is just fine. That's, that's, that's all I'm going to read. So. Yeah, Frank is feeling pretty conflicted. On the one hand, he is scared senseless over the thought of where Joe might be, what condition she might be in. Is she even alive? And those thoughts are causing him to find the robots that took her and destroy every last one of them. At the same time, he's feeling a bit philosophic. He's mentioned before that while he has taken lives in the past, It's not something that he likes to do, and he's trying not to do it anymore. And the idea that these robots might be alive simply because they have replicated themselves, built other robots to uh, propagate their robotic species, you know, that's got him thinking. What constitutes existence? And yet, in that dark part of his brain, that lizard part of his brain that he assumes probably, maybe, possibly come from whoever he was before he died and was brought back to life. That part of him just wants to freaking kill everything. He's, he's just, he's angry and he's scared. And I, I feel for Frank. Now, I forgot to mention that Warren, who is uh, another robot, it, he's basically just a, like a chrome sphere, a little bit bigger than a softball. And he's got arms with a, uh, white gloved hands that look like Mickey Mouse's hands, doesn't doesn't have eyes, doesn't have a mouth, literally just a smooth sphere. Well, he is he's he's like the first robot or the one of a group of the first robots that Dr. Flem made. They are uh, he calls them his helping hands. And there's they're all metallic spheres, but each one uh, has different things coming off of it. And in the previous issue, we learned that Marie, who is another one of these helping hand robots, and she actually looks like, I mean, her and her and Warren are practically identical. She got blown up as she was escaping with Myron. Marie is the reason Myron got out and was able to find Frank. And so Myron is with them. He is with Frank and Astro Man and Myron. And then we learn here that the other helping hands robots were were sent ahead. I should also mention, if you haven't read these, they they all float. These these helping hands robots, they float. Anyway, he had sent the others ahead to scout out the the tunnels because they because eventually they come to a tunnel that is not part of the rocket car tunnels. That was obviously what the the robots used to get to Doctor Flem's lab, and that's where these little helping hand robots have gone, and they're coming back to report. And that's when they find Marie, who is cracked open, 
Most of her is in pieces. And Warren, who, again, metallic sphere with hands. That's all he is. He's a robot. No face. No eyes. Doesn't talk. Well, Warren actually lets out a squeal at seeing Marie because Warren and Marie, despite the fact that they're robots, had a, had a little thing going on. They were engaged together in a, a deep emotional relationship. And so with Warren and the other helping hand robots looking on, they bury Marie there in the tunnels, stat pile rocks atop of her, uh, atop of her grave. And uh, one of the robots carves an M into her gravestone. And then they, they have a moment of silence for her. This also kind of shakes Frank up, not just because of these robots that, you know, I don't know if Frank feels he's emotionally attached to them or not, but he's seeing the way Warren has reacted. And that's got, that, that, that has shaken him a bit more because again, do these robots have souls? Are they living beings? And if so, can he really go in there and destroy all of them? And Warren reacting the way he does to Marie's death has, uh, has Frank. Well, here, I'll read you just a little bit more from his journal. Was Marie really dead? Was she gone forever? Couldn't she be rebooted just like Astro Man? They had to have her memory on file somewhere, you'd think. Yes, you'd think. But I've never seen pain come from an object before. Warren has no eyes, no mouth, but I could swear he was sobbing. If he had no hope for Marie's return, how could anyone? I'm walking, and I feel like I'm asleep. A waking dream. I've become a robot. I can't feel the blood run through my arteries anymore. My heart no longer beats. I can still think. Can I feel? Is artificial intelligence existence? True existence? Something is moving in my head. It feels like my brain is tossing and turning. What's happening to me? And that's when they encounter some of those, like the, the soldier robots, that the same ones Frank and the big guy fought, and the same ones, or the same model or whatever, that came and kidnapped everybody from Dr. Flem's lab. And so we get a bit here where Myron and Frank and Astro Man and the helping hand robots all battle these robots. Astro Man flies ahead to find giant robots in their path. Frank's pistols have no, you know, they can't do anything to these giant robots. So he pulls out his flamethrowing rifle and the giant robots disappear. They run away or something. And they basically escape down a, like a big black, dark, deep pit. And so that's where our team go after them. They find themselves in like this underground, almost, almost like a city that these robots have built for themselves. And as they're making their way through the city, these giant robots come out again and attack them. Frank can't really do anything against them, but Astro Man has his, uh, what Frank calls his good old Astro Blasts, which literally just melt beams of, of, of heat or whatnot that melt straight through these robots, turns, the, turns their metal shells into liquid metal super fast. And they feel like that the big robots, they're not, they're, they're going down easy. They're not really programmed to fight. They're just there to kind of slow them down. And as Myron points out, to shepherd them, they're, they're being led like sheep and they're being led straight to Factor Max. And he is sitting on a big metal throne and he's got that thing behind him that looks like a uh looks like the the background in the in the looney tunes intros and i think it's actually a giant eye from a giant robot uh that's the way it looks in the panel i'm looking at anyway or the the splash page well factor max is really happy to see them because what we find out is he has been looking for frank the 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 raid on the lab the the capturing of all of frank's friends and loved ones it, it was all he was looking for frank and so Frank charges Factor Max, and so does Astro Man and Myron and the rest. But Factor Max throws up this force field that doesn't allow metal through. And it is placed around Factor Max, and Frank finds himself inside this force field dome thing. And the robots are outside, so they can't get through. And in fact, somehow as this force field is, is 
being generated, Frank can go through it. But for example, in this panel, his his hands clutching two of the pistols were outside of the force field when it went up. So when he tries to put, pull his hands in, the guns can't come through with him. So he is unarmed. And then this is where we learn what the robots want, what Factor Max wants, why he tried to kidnap Professor Boyford previously, and what he wants with Frank now. And basically, these robots have learned that Professor Boyford brought Frank back to life. Professor Boyford has this formula that can make people immortal or bring you back if you die. Well, as far as Factor Max is concerned, that is the secret to life, existence, life, the universe, and everything. And he wants, he, he's basically, When all these robots started building more robots to, again, propagate their robotic species, Factor Max apparently stood up and became their leader. And he wants this knowledge that Professor Boyford has. In fact, what he tells Frank is, you and the Professor Boyford have touched the hand of the ultimate and returned to tell about it. Tell us. These facts are known to us. You must hold the codes to the ultimate. You must reveal them to us freely in their purity. We need this knowledge of creation to correct our calculations in order to truly exist. If you do not comply, I will begin draining the life force from the ones you care about. So we learn here at this point that Gail and Joe and Mott, Dr. Flem, Bonnie, they're they're all alive. They're being held captive. They're inside like these glass chambers. Some of them are domes and some of them are big tubes. And Factor Max starts torturing them. And of course, Frank is focused on Joe, who is just screaming in pain. There is the look on her face, the way there's a panel in here where Aura draws Joe screaming. There are tears coming out of her eyes and there's lightning all around her. There's actually spittle coming from her mouth. And it's a, it's really hard to look at. It's done so well. And Laura's, Laura Allred's colors, she, be, because all these, you know, because, well, <laughs> I got to learn how to talk. Because she is under glass in this dome, she has kind of a grayish, bluish hue. Everything, her, her, her face, her clothes, um, she's a grayish blue uh, with accents of black. Very much like Frank how he looks underneath his costume. But Frank is trying to tell Factor Max that he does not have these answers that Factor Max wants. He doesn't know. He may have died and been brought back to life, but he doesn't doesn't know how it worked. He doesn't know anything. He doesn't remember anything prior to that. He, He has no knowledge of meeting any kind of creator while he was dead or learning the secrets of the universe or anything like that. And he's trying. He's just begging at this point. He's he's literally he says it himself. I'm on my knees and he's trying to at this point because Factor Max is just not listening to him. And so Frank is trying to, you know, if he has this information in his head, he's trying to force it out at this point. He says, I'm on my knees and he just starts spouting numbers. He's looking for codes. He's hoping that something comes out that, you know, just if he just starts spouting numbers, that something will come out that that. uh. Factor Max can use. But as he's doing this, suddenly something really weird happens to Frank. It's going to be really hard for me to describe. It's one of those things that you almost kind of have to see it. But Frank is, uh, he's kneeling, he's got sweat pouring off of his face, and that little antenna from his head pops out, the little flesh antenna that he calls his third eye. It pops out and suddenly. Frank just arches back and he screams and there's lightning coming out of him. I don't know if that's actual lightning coming out of him or if that's just supposed to represent the excruciating pain that Frank is probably in at this point. And then suddenly, this is where it gets super weird. He turns blue. He's making this noise that, you know, in text, it's N-Y-E-E. So he's going, nee. I guess, I guess that's the sound he's making, just screaming it. And he turns blue and then suddenly from transitioning from his normal look to everything about him turns into a gray blue. And then that all turns liquid. 
and his head turns liquid and changes into a big liquid eyeball that floats up over him and it it his head didn't turn into it something it like enveloped it came out of him enveloped his head and floated up over the top of him uh from his antenna that's where it seems to be coming from his antenna basically just expands turns into an eyeball breaks off cuz it's 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 floating above him attached like like an umbilical cord with his flesh antenna and then it breaks off and then starts raining liquid down atop Frank and suddenly Frank is drowning in water it's like a, a formation of water that's only around Frank the water goes away and hits a bunch of robots and sh- shorts them out and then Frank falls to the ground and now he's making this sound he's just going oh you know like a monk oh and in the span of a panel He's laying on the ground in one panel and the next panel, he's suddenly just ancient, like everything about him just advanced 200 years and he looks like a withered husk. And from there, it's like, ah, man, it's just so weird. It's hard to describe. He turns into earth. He's like an earth version of Frank and tentacles, dirt tentacles, mud tentacles. I don't know. They just shoot out of his head and rocks and freaking lightning and all this stuff just slam into factor max. Frank is suddenly himself again, but he's kind of floating and his antenna thing is just whipping about him and the the glass containers that his friends were inside shatter and they're they're able to to escape. Mott, I think he describes the way they're all feeling rather perfectly. He just says, "I think I'd like to go home to Hoople now." Astro Man yells out to Frank, don't Frank, pull back, you'll destroy yourself. And then Frank, again, it's like he turns into this weird withering husk of a person. He, he's, he's, there's cracks forming all over him. He is, he's purple. And it's not just him, it's that the entire costume is, is turning purple. And then suddenly Factor Max is there. So whatever this, this lightning and these rocks and whatnot that hit him didn't take him out. Factor Max is there and he reaches out and takes Frank by the throat and that suddenly stops whatever's happening to Frank. However, his antenna is still just whipping around about him. It's like 15, 20, 30 feet long at this point. And it just starts wrapping around Factor Max and wraps around his robotic neck and then pop, pulls Factor Max's head right off his body and Frank and the head fall to the ground. And this has one of my favorite endings to a book ever. All right. So the last three pages are Frank floating. He's turning purple. His antenna's whipping around. Factor Max reaches out, grabs his throat. Page two of the the last three, the antenna wraps itself around Factor Max, pulls his head off. And the, the final panel on the second to last page, Frank falls onto the ground on his back with a big thwam. And then you turn to the last page, it's got five panels. Four of them take up a little over the top half of the page. They're kind of narrow, widescreen panels. And the first one, well, in each one of these four panels, it's it's they're all set up the same. You have on the left side, from the left, the 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 left hand bottom corner of the panel, there is a bit of cloud with a bit of mountain sticking out of the cloud. On the right side of the panel, in the upper right, coming out of the upper right corner, is more cloud. And then there's just blue sky between. Frank is on the left side and he's stepping out of the cloud. He's on the mountaintop, stepping out of the clouds. And on the right side, the clouds in the upper corner, there's a, you see just, you see three fingers of what has to be a giant hand coming out of the clouds. And Frank's narration says, that's when I saw the hand of God. Was I dead? Almost dead? That's the second panel. The hand is now moved closer to Frank. Frank reaches out his hand. And then in the third panel, the hand of God is now making like an okay sign with his hand, right? Like if you make an okay sign and stick it out in front of you so that your fingers are, are perpendicular to the ground. That's what, that's what God is doing right now. And Frank is even closer and he's, his hand is stretched out and he's about to touch the hand of God. And, uh, 
the caption in the third panel says, was it my time? <laughs> and then that fourth panel, God wasn't making an okay sign. He was getting his freaking index finger ready to flick. And he flicks Frank right off the mountaintop. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the narration box just says, I guess not. That's when I saw the hand of God. Was I dead? Almost dead? Was it my time? Flick? I guess not. And then the final panel on the, on the page is the bottom panel, and it takes up, well, about a third of the page. And it's Frank and everybody, Dr. Flem, Bonnie, Mott, Astro Man, Machina or Machina, Gale, Myron, Warren, the head of Factor Max, and Joe is helping Frank up off the floor. And he is obviously looking like he just woke up from, uh, from being unconscious. He's got, you know, the, the cartoony stars around his head and whatnot. And he's just saying, what's the skinny? And that's it. That's the end of the issue. And it says, next, the truth about everything and all the rest. This, um, I really just, I mean, I loved this issue. It's, it's like everything that, that, that Allred has been doing with Frank up to this point. It's, it's like it was all leading to this point, but yet it's not like we were reading one big story. It's more like uh, Frank as a character, he has been growing and developing as this series has continued all the way back from the very first three issue mini to now, which is 16 issues, 16 issues worth of story. We kind of see Frank grow and become more of the person that he's going to be. And in this issue, he has a real, because at the very beginning, if you remember from that very first issue, Frank was in that basement that he had made into his home in, in some building. And he had, Dr. Boyford had died or got hit by a car and was dying. And uh, Boyford told Frank that he had to freeze him uh, and then find Dr. Flem because Flem would be able to bring him back. And so Frank did just that. And he is in that basement writing in his journal. And two thugs come in, and they are the thugs of a, a guy named Monstat. And we learn right away that Frank had killed one of their fellow thugs. So from the get-go, we have Frank as a killer. During that confrontation with the two thugs, he knocks one down, pulls his eye out of his eye socket, and eats it in front of the other thug. He quickly throws it back up once the other thug is sufficiently scared and runs away, but that's where Frank was when everything started. And as we continue, as Frank and Joe's relationship starts to uh, blossom, because uh, at that time with that first issue, Frank had no idea who Joe was. He had, when, when, when Boyford was hit by the car, the trauma of seeing that, that's what made Boyford die and had uh, Frank freeze him so Flem could bring him back. But the trauma of seeing that made Frank regress. So he had already died. He had been brought back to life. He was making huge steps as a person. He had met Joe. He had started a detective agency. He had met Joe. There was obviously a connection between the two of them. And then Boyford gets hit by this car. Frank regresses. He can't remember anything, so he can't remember Joe. But eventually, by the time that three-issue series ends, him and Joe are back together. And so as their relationship has blossomed, because then in the, you know, we see them, we see them going out on a date, Frank meets Joe's dad, and there's just, there's a lot between Frank and Joe. They're just falling more and more in love every single issue. And I think it's because of that. It's because of her influence that whatever, whoever he used to be before he died, which sounds like he wasn't a good guy, that part of him is still inside him. And he's been fighting against it. And I think Joe has been a big part of helping Frank with that. And Frank has, has, uh, you know, really become a good guy, you know, a hero. And then this issue comes along and Joe is, is kidnapped and Frank is just ready to kill anybody that gets in his way. And then he thinks he dies and he's getting ready to be let into the doors of heaven. And God says, nah, and knocks him back down to earth. And, uh, Frank wakes up and it's, I, I just, I don't remember anything that comes after this. I know, I, I feel like I've read some of this stuff, you know, obviously, obviously I read, cause I, I have read Nexus meets Madman. That's what we're going to talk about next. I read the Superman. I've read the, the, the 
Madman, Superman, Hullabaloo. We're going to be talking about those too. But as far as the main comic, Madman Comics and Frank's story in, in the main title, I don't remember what's next. And I feel like we have, I feel like we've hit the end of a chapter and the next issue is going to start a whole new chapter for Frank. He, um, I don't know. I just, I can't wait to see who Frank is when we get to issue number 11. I mean, I'm assuming he's going to be very, the, the same old Frank, but I think he's going to have a bit of a different outlook on life. Maybe. Um, I don't know. I'm just really excited to get to that point. Now, that being said, next week, we step away from Madman Comics and we are going to talk about the first Madman crossover. He crosses over with a with a few various characters from time to time. And this is an issue called Nexus meets Madman. And it was just a one shot special. I remember that Nexus was being published at the time. It had, It was a book that had been around for a while and I would kind of see it on the shelves and I really didn't pay that much attention to it until Nexus met Madman. And then I started reading Nexus books. I don't remember getting into them too much, but yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, reading that one. And then the following week, we will read Madman Comics number 11. And again, I don't know what to expect. There's a part of me that feels like we're going to get kind of a transition issue that it's going to be kind of like a done in one fun little thing, but I don't know. Typically, In the history of comics, you know, going back through like the 70s and 80s or whatnot in the 90s, whenever your character was involved in a kind of a a big story arc that had a big epic conclusion to it. And I don't know that I would call this a big epic conclusion, but it felt like it. It felt like a big moment in Frank's life. And it feels like the ending of one story. And now we're going to start a new story. Typically in a comic book series, they'd give you like a transition issue, you know, like your hero would spend the issue shopping at the grocery store or something and, and something silly would happen to them. You know, just a fun, lighthearted story to uh, get us prepared for what may what may come next. And I don't know if that's what we're going to get with issue number 11, but uh, that's kind of what I expect. Now, I talked about this last week, but I just want to remind everybody. So next week is going to be Nexus meets Madman number one, then the week after. So that's going to be February 14th. The next week, February 21st, we're going to look at Madman Comics number 11. And then the following three weeks, February 28th, March 7th, and March 14th, we're going to look at that three issue Superman, Madman, Hullabaloo mini that came out in the summer of 97. And then we're going to pause on the Madman. We're going to walk away from the Madman and I'm going to do something different, uh, do another, you know, I'm, I, shift over to one of the other characters or comics that I've been kind of focusing on. And we'll do that for a couple of months and eventually we'll get back to Frank, but really enjoyed this issue. Really enjoyed it. It's a, you know, this is the, the issue that concludes the first volume of the Madman library editions. And it really did feel like the end of a story. And I really enjoyed it. And, uh, hats off to the Allreds and Mr. Cannot is, a. This is one of the best ones so far. But yeah, next week, Nexus meets Madman, number one. I did read that back in 86 when it was published, but heck if I can remember anything about the story. So looking forward to that one for sure. Until then, folks, my name is Steven, and I'm just another fanboy. Be nice to each other. The Just Another Fanboy podcast is a Stephen or else production. Questions and comments can be directed to justanotherfanboy at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram by searching for at Stephen or else, and then come join in on all the fun at the Just Another Fanboy message boards at forum.justanotherfanboy.com. You can support the show for as little as a dollar a month over at the Patreon by going to patreon.com slash Stephen R. Or, and in return, I am going to do my very very best to get you and your fellow patrons episodes just like this one before anybody else. I also encourage you to rate the show wherever available and share this episode with a friend. All links will be in the show notes. Bye bye daddy. Bye bye daddy. Good job. <laughs> uh oh. Hello and welcome to just another b- 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 fartin. I don't know why I say fart when I mess up, but fart automatically comes to my brain.
Hello and welcome to another episode of Just Another Fanboy. Did I did 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 my voice <laughs> did my voice crack there? Was I like Peter Brady? Time for change. Sounded like I was like, hello and welcome to another. <sighs> Let's try that again. Let's do it. Hello and welcome to another episode of Just Another Fanboy, the podcast that bah, 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 bah. he may have been brought back to life. He may have died. He and brought back, you know. He may have been. Blah, 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 blah. Boyford had got hit with. Ha. Go away.